Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, speak to us this morning through your word. Spirit of God, illumine your word to our hearts. And Son of God, our precious Lord Jesus, be glorified in the preaching and teaching of your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, I was going to begin this sermon by telling a story or a few stories of some significant event that required an unbelievable amount of forgiveness. You think of some of the things that have happened, the ways some people have been sinned against or hurt. Uh, we think of Corey Ten Boom forgiving those Nazis who killed her family, or think of those folks in South Carolina in that, in that church where that white supremacist Dylan Roof broke into that church and killed a bunch of people at a Bible study and they offered forgiveness. Uh, think of uh, this one-room Amish schoolhouse in Pennsylvania a number of years ago. A gunman went in there and slaughtered a bunch of Amish children and those Amish families offered forgiveness within hours of those murders. And, and there's a place for that. There's a place for thinking about forgiveness in terms of these big, huge, significant events. But it's kind of like the husband who says, uh, I'm willing to take a bullet for my family and willing to die for my family. And the wife says, well, that's great, but can you do the dishes, you know? <laughs> Some of you, no doubt, have been sinned against in ways that are significant and huge. Some wicked things have been done. But all of us, every single person sitting in this room has been sinned against in a whole bunch of different ways, right? And you need help in knowing how to forgive the church member who gossiped about you or a spouse who's been ignoring you or been harsh with you. Uh, maybe you need help with forgiving the child who's been disrespectful, the neighbor who's been rude, the boss who's been demanding, the pastor who hasn't been all that you hoped he would be, whatever it might be. Maybe your situation is really big. Maybe it's just the normal stuff of life, but we all need to know how to forgive. A couple of weeks ago, we studied through 2 Corinthians chapter 2 in ABF. And in that passage, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church about how to forgive and to restore a brother who had sinned really grievously against him and against the Corinthian church. And it seemed to me that that lesson touched a bit of a nerve for some folks. And as a pastor, I've been part of plenty of conversations about forgiveness and I don't think it's going too far to say that forgiveness is actually one of the defining characteristics of the Christian life. And when I say that, I do mean the Christian life. A non-Christian really has no capacity to truly forgive. I think the, some of the anger evident in our culture is just one, one of the symptoms of what it is when people don't know how to respond when they have been wronged. But a lack of forgiveness, and you know this, isn't just a problem out there in the secular culture, right? Lack of forgiveness is a problem in our own churches, in our own marriages, in our own families, in our own relationships. Unforgiveness is kind of like a disease. It's a disease of the heart and of the mind, of the spirit, and it's the cause of a lot of troubles. Unforgiveness locks us into the past. We live by what happened to us a week ago or a year ago or a decade ago. It skews our judgment. When we, when we don't forgive, we tend to see everything through the ways we've been sinned against or we tend to see uh, the other person only in how they've sinned against us. Unforgiveness can cause physical and mental pain. I'm sure a fair share of ulcers and insomnia and anxiety have, have this root in bitterness against others. It wastes mental time. How much time have you spent arguing with someone in your head, right? 
I have. How much time have you spent dwelling on the way someone wronged you that could have been spent elsewhere? Unforgiveness breaks relationships. It stunts our maturity in Christ. I think spiritually we plateau at times when we have held something against someone without forgiving. It inhibits our testimony. We look a lot like the world when we hold on to sin, right? We look just like the world and we don't have anything to offer them. And ultimately, unforgiveness robs God of glory. We're made in God's image. And Christians are put the character and nature of God on display. And a heart that refuses to forgive presents an inaccurate picture of who God is. Our God is a forgiving God. You know, when God revealed himself to Moses on the mountain, Exodus chapter 34, and he's going to say, here I am, this is who I am, and tell the children of Israel, this is who I am. They need to know who their God is. He mentions his justice in there, but he front loads his introduction to Israel with his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness. This is what he says to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, he's identifying himself. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. God leads off in identifying himself as a merciful and a loving God. And you read through the Bible and you just see this over and over and over again. And Jesus Christ is known and loved and worshipped because he was the one who brought forgiveness to sinners. John Chrysostom, an early church father, he said, nothing makes us so like God than forgiving. Or maybe you've heard the, the, the more modern version of that. To err is human, right? To forgive is divine. To err is human and to forgive is divine. If our goal is to be more like Christ and to make Christ known, then a grasp on biblical forgiveness is critical. And Jesus dealt with forgiveness a number of times in the Gospels, and we're going to examine one of his parables today. So if you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And as you turn to Matthew 18, I want to mention it's important we understand what this parable is teaching and what the parable is not teaching. This parable is not meant to teach everything there is to know about forgiveness. As a matter of fact, this sermon is not meant to teach you everything there is to know about forgiveness. We'd have to be here a long time for that. But sin and the need for forgiveness, it's a part of the reality of life, even in the church. And so we want to listen to what Jesus teaches here about forgiveness. He starts out by telling us that forgiveness requires more than we would like to imagine, verses 21 and 22. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Now, it's important that we understand in the context what's happening here. Jesus, in the previous verses, just got done teaching his disciples about what we call church discipline. That is, what do you do when a brother or sister in Christ has sinned against you? And Jesus teaches, you're supposed to go to them and confront them. If they won't listen to you, take someone else. If they won't listen to someone else, tell it to the church. If they won't listen to the church, they are to be sent out from the church. That's what to do if someone doesn't listen to you. Peter's asking... Yeah, but what do I do if they do listen? What do I do if they do repent? How many times do I have to forgive? And Peter thinks he's being gracious and generous. The rabbis in Jesus' day, in Peter's day, taught that you needed to forgive a sin three times. The same sin three times and no more. And Peter has been around Jesus long enough to know, well, Jesus is raising the bar. So what about seven times? Do I have to forgive seven times? How many times do I really have to forgive the same sin done against me? Peter's problem and the Jews' problem and our problem. 
my problem and your problem is that we tend to think of forgiveness like it's a commodity that you hand out and that you run out of. You dole out in certain doses and then stop. But Jesus' answer doesn't allow that. Forgiveness can't be quantified. Maybe some of your translations read 70 times 7. Some of them read 77. It's all a translation issue, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Either way, Jesus is saying you can't quantify it. The point is clear. You can't put a number on forgiveness. Forgive without limit. Forgive without stopping. Someone has sinned against you. You could count to seven. You could keep, that, keep track of that and then stop forgiving. Nobody's keeping track of 77 or 490 or whatever. Eventually, you've got two options. You either just decide you're going to stop forgiving or you make it a way of life. You forgive and you forgive and you forgive and it's a way of life. Now, your mind might be going to all kinds of, well, what if or what about and so forth. And, of course, again, this text isn't all the Bible has to say about forgiveness. But before you protest, before you think about the caveats to what Jesus is saying, let what he says just sink in here. If you really get what Jesus is saying, it's going to seem too radical. It's going to seem impractical. It's going to seem extreme. It probably seems foolish. And it almost certainly is going to seem impossible. But what Jesus is teaching is that forgiveness is to be abundant and free and exorbitant. It requires more of us than we really like to imagine. Forgiveness also, as Jesus goes on in this parable, forgiveness is received before it is granted. It's received before it is granted. Look at verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Now, it's always a bad idea in, when we're studying parables to press every detail of the parable and make some sort of spiritual point about it. That's not how parables work. But here, Jesus tells a story about forgiveness in a particular order for a particular reason. Forgiveness received comes before forgiveness granted. Now, many of you know this story, and you know that a talent in Jesus' day was a weight of silver. And a talent of silver was worth 6,000 denarii. A denarii, a denarius, was one day's wage for a common laborer. So a little math here. 10,000 talents is 60 million days wages or 200,000 years worth of labor. Okay? So if we were to put in today's numbers, do a little bit of math, at somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 billion dollars, with a B, 10 billion dollars. So this servant has amassed a debt, not just beyond the ability to pay, he amassed a debt that's not even possible. The number is absurd. Scholars believe that in Jesus' day, the gross domestic product of all of Palestine, the entire region, was only what would be today $8 billion. And a servant has somehow gotten a debt to $10 billion. It's, like, it's just unbelievable, right? And that's if we take the, the Greek word there for 10,000 as a literal number. That word is the biggest number you can express in Greek, the biggest number. It would be like if, uh, if, if my son said to me, Dad, that, 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 that bird flew by, it's going like kajillion miles an hour, right? We've heard those kind of things around our house, right? A kajillion or a gazillion or whatever. This is this huge, unbelievable number. That's the number Jesus uses to refer to the debt the servant went into. Now, you might be saying, how could a servant ever go into that amount of debt? That's not the point. That's not the point. 
The point is the amount of debt is outrageous. And there's no ability whatsoever for the servant to pay it. And in this parable, you are the servant. You are the servant. The master is God. And the debt is Romans 3.23. How far you have fallen short of the glory of God due to your sin. It's a debt beyond even enumerating, let alone paying. And like the master in the parable, the debt is forgiven. Sheerly out of grace, out of compassion. God forgives sin by his grace, undeserved. And right here, right here is where we need to be when we are tempted to hold someone's sin against them because it seems worse than mine. This is where we need to land whether it's your spouse's sin, your employer's sin, your neighbor's neighbor's sin, or those political opponents and their sin. To consider their sin as greater than your own is to show you don't understand the depths of your own sin. Your debt to God is infinite, and there's no way to pay it, and Christ has paid it for us. And if I could just say uh, briefly, speak to some of you, Some of you may be struggling to forgive, may be struggling to forgive because you have never been forgiven. You've never never experienced that release of your debt. And so it's really hard for you to even imagine releasing someone else of their debt to you. It's like uh, when you fly, before the flight takes off, the Flight attendant comes out, and they give that little safety talk that no one ever listens to, right? And part of that safety talk is, you know, if if the cabin depressurizes and those little oxygen masks come down. Do you remember what they say? Before you help your child or who's sitting next to you put the mask on, what do they tell you to do? Put your own mask on. That's because at 35,000 feet, if the cabin depressurizes, you've got a matter of seconds before you're going to start feeling the effects of a lack of oxygen. And then you're, then you're no good to you or to your neighbor. If you're not breathing the gospel air of forgiveness, if you've never received that breath of gospel oxygen and the weight of your sins taken away, you're not going to be of any good to be able to forgive someone else of the ways they've sinned against you. Unforgiven sinners can't forgive like Christ commands because they haven't experienced the forgiveness that Christ offers. But for those who are forgiven by God through Christ, forgiveness is not only possible, it's the only sensible response. Look at number three. It's the only sensible response. Unforgiveness is irrational for the forgiven. It's irrational not to forgive for the forgiven. Here we go, verse 28. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother. From your heart. A servant who'd been so so recently released from just this unimaginable debt was owed the sum of a hundred denarii, hundred days' wages. Not an insignificant amount. Uh, again, maybe several thousand dollars today. It was enough that the servant might have missed it and would have been glad to have received it. But in comparison to what he had just been forgiven, it was a paltry amount, right? 
and yet he refused to forgive the debt. And listen, all of us read this thing the same way, right? We're all repulsed. We feel like those other slaves are like, what did you, I can't believe what he just did. We saw him being forgiven and then he does this? All of us get, feel that same revulsion toward that servant. We shake our heads at him. This is ridiculous. And remember, when Jesus tells this parable, he's saying, you are that man. We are like him when we don't forgive. Now, Jesus isn't saying it should be easy to forgive. It isn't easy to forgive. It's not natural to forgive. It's usually not even enjoyable to forgive. However, it is Christian to forgive. And we really have no other option. It's irrational not to forgive. And that's the reason for that warning at the end of the parable in verse 35. In case we weren't sure exactly what Jesus was getting at, it's right here. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. Now, just in the verse before, it says that the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Let me ask you this question. If that servant were to be put into prison and say, you don't get out of prison until your family and friends can raise enough money to pay back your debt, how long would that take? There's an answer. How long would that take? Forever. There's no way they're paying back that debt, right? This is an allusion to eternal punishment. Jesus is saying if you're, if you're the kind of person who doesn't forgive, if you refuse to forgive, you're demonstrating that you're not a child of God. This is not saying someone loses their salvation by unforgiveness. He's not teaching that. But an unforgiving spirit, someone who's just unwilling, unwilling to forgive others of their sin, there's a sign that that person has not been forgiven. This is what Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember the, the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And a few verses later, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Not forgiving others is kind of like sawing off the branch that you're sitting on. We, we're Christians. The, the whole, our whole point is that we're forgiven, right? That's the whole point. We're a bunch of people who acknowledge that we have sin and that we need to be forgiven and we come to Jesus to be forgiven. That's the branch we're sitting on. And then when we refuse to offer forgiveness, we're sawing that branch right off. So the importance of forgiveness is found right here in this parable in Matthew chapter 18. And with our time remaining, I want to, I want to get practical about forgiveness. Maybe you're sitting here this morning, hopefully you agree with me this morning that forgiveness is the mark of a Christian. You agree that places, times when you have struggled with unforgiveness, that's a problem. It, it, it denies the gospel that you hold dear and you want some help. And so let's talk about this a little bit this morning. And I, I want to answer some questions about forgiveness. And we want to start with what is forgiveness. Now, it may seem odd that we're asking this question after talking through a whole parable on forgiveness. But I think understand exactly what it is can be helpful. Is, is forgiveness an emotion? Is it forgetting about someone's sin? What is forgiveness? And let's start with what forgiveness is not. What it is not. It is not pretending we're not hurt or offended. It's not shrugging off a sin or a harm that's done to us. It's not rolling our eyes and saying, whatever. It's not, it's not forgiveness. It's not making an excuse for someone or justifying their behavior. It's also not an emotion that you hope will come to you sometime. Sometimes, sometimes I'll hear that. Well, I just, I just haven't felt that. It's not passive. Forgiveness is not passive. It's not something outside your control. Forgiveness is also not necessarily fully trusting someone. There may be repercussions in a relationship that need to be worked through and dealt with. It doesn't mean that there are no consequences for sin at times. That's what forgiveness is not. What forgiveness is, is this. 
releasing someone from the debt they owe you due to their sin and then giving them what they don't deserve. Forgiveness is releasing someone from the debt that they owe you due to their sin and then giving them what they don't deserve. There are two words in the New Testament translated forgive, and, and they, they show both parts of this definition. There's a word afiemi, it means to release from a debt, to let go, to leave something behind. And charizomai, which means to be gracious to, to show grace, to pardon, to give freely. And we saw both of, this, both of these things right here in Matthew chapter 18. What did the master do? He released the servant from his debt, and then he showed grace to him and let him go. He withheld the punishment that the man deserved, and instead he sent him to go free. He didn't set up a payment plan. He didn't reduce the amount that was owed. He let him go. He canceled the debt. And this idea of releasing a debt is so key. I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to someone about forgiveness. And this is, I hear something like this. Someone has been wronged by someone else and they say, but it, it just seems so unfair. If I forgive him, I got the pain and he doesn't have to experience that. Like I, I'm taking on the pain and it seems like he gets away with it. This is so unfair. And my response is always, yes. It is unfair. It's exactly what it is. If one of you owed me $50,000, I don't know how that would ever happen, but if one of you owed me $50,000 and I canceled the debt, who loses in that transaction? Who's $50,000 poorer? I am. I've assumed that debt. You took the $50,000 and I lost. And it's unfair. Yes, it is unfair, but that's grace, and that's the gospel. That's the gospel. It is ridiculously unfair that I did the sin and Jesus paid the debt. It is unbelievably unfair. I earned the condemnation and he took it for me. It's unfair. It's unfair. The only way you can forgive like this be willing to take on the debt of someone else, release them from it, is to realize what God has done for you in Christ. That Jesus did this for you. By the way, this is why it's unbiblical to talk about forgiving yourself. Forgiving yourself is not a biblical concept. You're not in debt to yourself, right? Does it make any sense? When someone talks about needing to forgive themselves, what they really mean is that they have been unable to grasp God's forgiveness for them. Once you understand God's forgiveness for you, the shame and the guilt are taken away. Forgiveness is recognizing that someone has come into your debt because of sin, then freely releasing them from it, and then seeking to do good to that person. Unforgiveness wants a wrong to be avenged. Forgiveness, let's go of vengeance. Unforgiveness wants a wrong to be broadcast, to be known. And forgiveness wants that sin to be hidden and forgotten. When you've forgiven someone, you're glad when no one else knows about it. So how do I forgive? How do I forgive? We are emotional creatures. Oftentimes those emotions take us places we don't want to go. And it's not rare for someone to say, well, I want to forgive, but I don't know how. Or someone to say, well, I, I've tried to forgive, or I, I believe I've forgiven, but I still have these feelings. How do I deal with this? When we commit to releasing someone's debt, to forgiving them, we're, we're essentially making four promises to them. Now, I didn't come up with these. Um, but I have found them helpful. And I think they really are representative of what the scripture teaches about forgiveness. Four promises of forgiveness. 
When you forgive someone, you promise, number one, I won't bring it up again to use it against you. Number two, I won't talk about this to others. Number three, I won't dwell on this incident. And number four, I'm not going to let what happened stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. Okay? So, number one, I'm not going to bring this sin up to use it against you. I'm not going to bring it up to you to throw it back in your face. Number two, I'm not going to bring it up to others to gossip about you. Number three, I'm not going to bring it up to myself to dwell on it. And number four, I'm not going to let it hinder our personal relationship. And the reason why these promises, I think, are so helpful is because they allow your will to drive your emotions and not the other way around. You may never get there emotionally. I hope and pray you will. But you might not get there emotionally, but you can decide this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to promise to act this way toward this person. You're usually never in the mood to forgive. Forgiveness is rarely easy. It's usually required at an inopportune time. But you can make the promise to put their sin away. And the other person, can I just remind you, the other person doesn't deserve your forgiveness. If they deserved it, it wouldn't, they wouldn't need forgiveness. The fact that they have sinned against you means they don't deserve forgiveness. But we offer it graciously and freely. Uh, a third question, what if I can't forget? What if I can't forget? We all know the saying, forgive and forget. Um, sometimes I've heard some people say, well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. And when they say it like that, what they mean is, I don't really want to forgive, right? But sometimes Christians legitimately struggle because they remember the sin done against them. And I hear things like, I've forgiven her, but I can't forget the wrong she did to me. What, what do I do? And the question is, is forgiving someone's sin the same thing as forgetting? And the answer is no. God doesn't forget our sin. Now, I know Hebrews 8.12 says God will remember our sins no more. That doesn't mean he literally, there's this big gap in his knowledge of human events. God is omniscient and he knows everything. What it means is that God doesn't hold those sins against us. He sees us through the lens of, as a beloved child, not as a guilty sinner. We don't have to fear God's condemnation because we don't relate to him in shame because he's taken away our sins in Christ. That's what it means. And Paul says we're to be forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We don't need to see another person through their sin. We can see them as husband, as wife, as sibling, as friend, as believer, as coworker, whatever. Not that person who sinned against me. And even though forgiving isn't the same as forgetting, the sweet thing, I have found this. Maybe you found this too. Have you ever found that when you truly forgive someone, over time, you do start to forget. You do start to forget. This may sound like an odd little story, but after our lesson in ABF about forgiveness, someone came up to me uh, and talked to me and reminded me, oddly, reminded me of a way I had been sinned against. And I was like, oh, yeah. I, I, it just, it, it, I had forgotten about that. It was like, it's not in the forefront of my mind. I'm not thinking about it anymore because I had forgiven that person. And when we forgive, God is gracious to, to let that sin fall into the background. Our last question this morning, last question, must we always forgive? What if the other person is unrepentant? And I think it's important that we distinguish between two kinds of biblical forgiveness. What I call a transaction of forgiveness and a posture of forgiveness. Transactional forgiveness can only happen when two believer, between two believers when there's genuine repentance on the part of of the offender. And we see this in scripture. Luke chapter 17, listen to this. Jesus says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. This kind of forgiveness is only possible when the other person confesses his sin. And we can make a transaction. Will you forgive me? I forgive you. And there's reconciliation. 
And by the way, you can forgive even before you're 100% sure that the person has genuinely repented. As a matter of fact, you have to forgive even before you're sure that the person has genuinely repented. And here's why. Because there's only one being in the universe who knows someone's heart. There's only one being in the universe who knows for sure if someone is completely repentant. And so we forgive and we forgive and we forgive. But what if someone refuses to acknowledge his sin? What if, what if they're an unbeliever? And here's where we demonstrate a posture of forgiveness. And this can happen anytime. should be true of all believers all the time. And we see this in Scripture too. Stephen, when Stephen was being stoned, do you remember what he said? Lord, do not hold it to their charge. Here's Stephen being stoned. They're not asking for forgiveness. And he's saying, Lord, forgive them, right? Stephen wasn't obeying some kind of command there about forgiveness. He was just demonstrating the same heart that Jesus had, which was to forgive sinners. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so we're to love those who deliberately provoke us. To those, uh, we're to love those who have no intention to being reconciled to us. The Christian response to being wronged, whoever has done the wrong, is to lay aside the di- desire for revenge. Is to continue loving the one who wronged you and to repay his mistreatment with kindness. That's the Christ-like posture of forgiveness that we're to take. And anything else is just a form of religion. It might have Jesus in it. It might have the Bible attached to it, but it isn't living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is what we're all about, living out the gospel of Jesus Christ. We call ourselves Christians, not because we just get together once a week and do some religious things. Not even because we believe the teachings of a man named Jesus. We call ourselves Christians because we have acknowledged that we are sinners and that our sin has separated us from God, that we deserve death and hell, that we've accrued a debt to God that we could never repay. But God the Father offered up his son on the cross to pay the penalty of our sins and by confessing our sins and putting our faith in the work of Christ on the cross, We have the promise of forgiveness and eternal life with Christ. And this is our hope. This is our confidence. The debt has been paid for us. And so now we who have been so freely forgiven can freely forgive in the name of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, We rejoice in the forgiveness that we have received from you in Christ. You've taken our sin from us. You've canceled our debt. You've given us every blessing in Jesus Christ. And yet, Lord, I think we could all admit this morning that we can be like the servant in this parable, enjoying the forgiveness you provide and withholding that forgiveness from others. I know some sitting here this morning have been just wickedly sinned against. Lord, pour out your grace on their hearts. Help them to do what is humanly impossible. All of us, Lord, all of us are at times tempted to view our own sin as minute and the sins of others as massive. And Lord, by the power of your spirit, Remind us daily of the freeness of our forgiveness in Christ that we might freely forgive others for Jesus' sake. And it's in his name we pray.